and I, I am sensing that they are trying to get some other uh, point across to me, and I just I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by the fact that I'm about to answer this question because I know uh, that they already know what the answer is, and as soon as I answer it, then uh, they're going to make the point and, and really drive home what it is they're trying to prove to me and get across to me. Uh, and you go on and answer it, and sure enough, that, that occurs. We've all probably uh, been in situations such as that, and it is something that occurs throughout Scripture as well. Our Father uh, has asked a series of questions throughout the Bible, and uh, as a matter of fact, I, I read in one instance that probably the majority of questions asked in the Bible are questions uh, that are posed by God uh, for our contemplation. And what we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at some of those questions, and we're going to see... The, the point that God is trying to make so that we can take away major lessons uh, from those questions. Remember, uh, in those situations, we recognize that the folks asking the question are not asking because they need the information, but they're asking trying to provoke us to contemplate what it is uh, that they are putting before us. And so God, in, in a very similar way, is doing the same thing. You know, he knows all things. He, he does not need us to give him information that he was unaware of. But he is asking questions, rather, uh, to, to cause us and provoke our minds to go into deeper thought so that we might consider things that maybe we weren't willing to consider prior to the question. So let's begin tonight in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, and in verse 26, uh, we see here, For what is a man profited... If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, we understand that the answer to these questions are, are quite obvious. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We know the answer to that. We're all here because we're interested in eternity. We're interested in our souls being right with God for eternity. And so we understand that if we gain all of the physical things in this world, and in the process of doing so, lose our own soul, in other words, exchange or sell our soul, as it's sometimes stated, in exchange for something physical, that we don't actually gain anything when it comes to what really matters in this life, which is eternity. He then goes on and states, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, if our soul is of utmost importance, the answer is nothing is kind of an interesting answer, by the way, because you say nothing. Well, that means man will give nothing in exchange for his soul. In other words, I'm not even going to get anything out of it, but I'll give my soul away. No, it's not in that sense, but it's nothing in that man should not be willing to give anything in the exchange of then giving up his soul or giving up his right relationship with God and salvation that is available uh, through God. And so the answer to these questions are pretty easily understood as to uh, what it is uh, Jesus is, is uh, causing us to uh, think about and, and come to and conclude, uh, but let's really dig a little deeper and let's think about some things. Why is it that man is not profited anything uh, if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Well, number one, because uh, man would and man would be receiving uh, nothing but fire for what it is that he gained in exchange for his soul. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3 together. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we notice here in, in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So what do we gain? What is it that we really have if we have physical things and in order to gain them exchange our soul? Nothing. Because in the end of this life, it's all going to be fired. It's all going to be burned. Uh, and it will no longer be of any value to us when eternity breaks. Uh, it also, if it doesn't uh, burn in our lifetime, in other words, if we were to die before those physical things burn, uh, well, they're all going to rot anyway. Uh, there's nothing physical that we can hold on to that's not going to begin to lose its value and begin to rot. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and look with me here, beginning in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, beginning... Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, 
and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There is no guarantee that we have. There is no security system in existence that could ever prevent anything physical that we obtain from not rotting, from not becoming corruptible uh, because of its physical uh, decay, and from potentially not being stolen. Uh, it doesn't matter how high tech our security system is, there are thieves out there that could create some type of system that would be capable of penetrating through uh, as, as, as high a tech and, and advanced a security system that we might be able to uh, concoct. And so all physical things could rot and could be uh, stolen or destroyed. And so, again, the answer is we profit nothing uh, because it, it doesn't hold on to an eternal value. But it also would never satisfy. Let's just say for a moment that the physical things would not burn up. Let's just say for a moment that they could not be stolen. Let's just say for a moment that they could never be corrupted or, uh, or deteriorated. Well, even if we obtained all of them, we would never, ever be satisfied. The Proverbs writer states in Proverbs chapter 27 and in verse 20 uh, regarding the way in which man seeks after riches and seeks after things and the correlation between satisfaction and such efforts. Verse 27 of Proverbs, excuse me, verse 20 of Proverbs 27. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Man can, can obtain and obtain and obtain and obtain. Uh, and if he gains a billion dollars, he'll want two billion. If he gains two billion, he wants four billion. There's no amount of wealth that ever would yield satisfaction. And so the answer here uh, to the Lord's question is, uh, man has profited nothing and man should never exchange anything for his soul because his soul uh, should seek to be kept with all diligence. All right, let's go to another question. Let's go to Luke chapter 12 together. Luke chapter 12. And uh, look with me here in verse, uh, verse 51. Verse 51 of Luke chapter 12. Jesus asks us here, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? Question mark. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? He goes on to say, I tell you nay, but rather division. Uh, you know, a lot of times folks think that Jesus means that uh, I can do whatever it is I want to do, and Jesus is going to give me whatever it is that I want. A lot of times that's the idea of Jesus. Not that Jesus would come to drive division or come bringing a sword, but that he would come to bring peace in that we will be able to find peace doing what it is we want to do and when it is we want to do it. And Jesus is saying that's not what his mission is at all. But he has rather come to bring division and to bring a sword so that we could divide ourselves from ourselves and divide ourselves from what it is that we think is important, separate and apart from God, and rather cleave unto him at which point then and only then after going through uh, the misery in many ways of dividing ourselves from those things, will we then have peace? But the initial part is not peace at all. It is rather division, and it is all the characteristics that come with division. Uh, and so how then does Jesus bring about division? Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and in verse 12 we see, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, God's word is so powerful that it provokes us and causes us not only to recognize what it is we are doing, but why it is we are doing it. What is our mission? What is our agenda? What is our purpose in doing what it is we are trying to do? Uh, as, as a preacher, uh, I have folks approach me from time to time and try to explain themselves to me. Usually this happens when uh, we show up to a, a new congregation. So uh, I 
think we're far enough removed uh, from that point in our relationship together. It's almost been three years. I won't believe that. I can't believe it's been three years. It's blown by. Uh, this October, it will have been three years. Uh, but it doesn't matter, this congregation or any congregation, it's just generally a, a general a reality of, of preachers when they come to a new congregation. And this isn't just the case with me. I've heard other preachers say it as well. Usually, folks will be very quick to try and uh, engage with uh, the preacher and will begin to try to explain themselves. And oftentimes what they're trying to do is they're trying to explain uh, a certain situation in their life and, and maybe a pet sin that they have or a, a certain bend that they have on certain issues or topics. And usually what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to create the narrative or the story as to why it is they are where they are, why it is they believe what they believe, why it is they're doing what they're doing. Uh, and, and usually is the case, not always, but usually is the case, folks are looking for the preacher to kind of give them a pat on the back and say, well, you, that's just fine. I approve. Uh, and, and oftentimes when that occurs, uh, this approach, it's a warning flag that someone is, is looking for another man, doesn't matter if it's a preacher, just another man in general, for approval. Uh, well, folks, uh, me, elders, anyone, man, is not an approver, <laughs> cannot give approval, but God's word can. And it's so powerful, it can tell us why we are trying to do what we are trying to do. Not because we read in there, I'm going to the store because I'm trying to get cupcakes. That, that's not what I'm talking about. The more and more we dig into God's word, the more and more we value it and long to understand what God has given us in it the more and more we recognize, you know what, I'm trying to get away with this. I'm trying to figure out a way to feel comfortable in doing this. I'm trying to gain some further support in what I believe about this. But see, without reading God's word, we're going to be at peace with our intents of doing those things. But the more and more we come to Jesus, come to his word, the more and more we study and understand what it is that he has commanded us, guess what? The more and more divided we become from those things because we recognize our intent. We recognize, you know what? <laughs> I'm not seeking the kingdom first here. I'm seeking me first here. It's time to put those things aside. And so Jesus is asking us, do you think that I came to bring peace? I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division. I came to bring division. We have to understand the context of what it is he's saying there uh, and not misunderstand it. Remember the caveat that we uh, discussed uh, before kicking off this question. But uh, God's word uh, cuts us and divides us and provokes us to choose who it is we are going to love. Who it is we are going to love. Are we going to love God first and foremost? Or are we going to love ourselves first and foremost? Uh, you know, as, as time goes on, uh, and I'm sure you all are in the same boat, uh, you realize uh, how much growth is available uh, by applying God's word in our daily life. Uh, and you see and learn and experience more and more of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he thought about us. And because of us and our state, he went to the cross. And the more and more we come to realize uh, verses such as the golden rule, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, that we are to think about what others would want us to do unto them rather than what we want to do for ourselves. And folks, the opportunities to apply that in our daily living are abundant. We go to the gas station and see the gas station clerk, opportunity to apply in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. We have a discussion with our spouse about anything, about whether or not the floor is clean or uh, whether or not certain bills are going to get paid. It doesn't matter. Opportunity to apply, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. We get to interact with our brethren opportunity to apply Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. We get to interact with our children, opportunity to apply Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. And in order to do that, we have to choose to stop putting ourselves first 
and to start putting our love for God first. God tells us to love him with all of our being, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. God tells us that we cannot prioritize him in a list of priorities, but rather he is to be our life. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. Jesus tells us here and asks us, do you think that I came to bring peace? I did not division. Let me ask you this. Are you studying the Bible recognizing that Jesus came to bring division in your life? Or are you studying the Bible thinking, I'm ready for God to tell me how great I'm doing today. Let me see. Oh, look at how wonderful I am. And folks, when we don't understand that, that's why we get upset with the preacher when the preacher says certain things. Because we think, well, preacher, you're not telling me how great I am. I don't like this very much. When we get upset with the elders, well, elders, you're, you're, you're making me have to choose God, and I don't want to do that. I want to just keep doing what I want to do. But folks, if we would just do it on our own, we would be praying for and encouraging and supporting our elders and our preacher and our teachers that are speaking the truth because we recognize and understand Jesus did not come to make us feel comfortable in our sin. He came so that we could recognize the choice that we have and we could choose it and be forgiven. We can think about this question. There's another question that God asks in James chapter 4, verse 14. Very similar to the first point we studied there. James says, what is your life? What is your life? Then he gives us the answer. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. What is your life? You know, oftentimes we don't think about this question enough. Just like we don't think, I would say, and I'm in this boat at least, we don't think about the question of what does it profit us if we gain the whole world? Oftentimes we go through our daily life and we think, world, I got to get it, I got to get it, I got to get it as much as I can. My life, I need to keep it. My life, this is my life. I need it, I need it. My life, me, me, me. And James is asking us here, God is asking us through James, what is your life though? Why are you so concerned about your life? It is but a vapor. It is but a vapor. We're told that the days are evil in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16. The days are evil. We're told that those that seek to toil in the uh, concerns of this physical world, they're all going to burn up. Chapter 1 of this book, verse 11. We're also told that if we're going to gain our life, we must lose our life first. Jesus states, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 16, and in verse 25, he states, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall are we willing to lose our life in Christ? In other words, are we willing to give up our life so that we can live, rather than for our own selves, live for Christ? Two more questions that have been asked that we're going to study this evening. God asks in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9, we've studied this from this very perspective before, but let's review it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9, God asks, where art thou? Calling unto Adam. Where art thou? Uh, we won't study it in this context because, again, I know we've done that somewhat recently. But uh, think for just a moment uh, of how that question would apply to you. Uh, where are you? Right now. Where are you? God knows the answer. You can't fool God. <laughs> if you're lost, if you've drifted away from the Lord, God knows that. So ask yourself, where are you now? Are you right with God? God here is asking and provoking Adam to contemplate that. And by the way, it's not physical. Uh, Adam had disobeyed the Lord. He had disobeyed the Lord. Uh, another question that, uh, that Jesus asks in Mark chapter 8 and verse 29, our final question for this evening, Mark chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus asks there to Peter, um, verse 29 of Mark 8, But whom say ye that I am? But whom say ye? That I am. You might recall, uh, 
he had asked already in verse 27, who do men say that I am? Uh, and then they had answered, some say John the Baptist, some Elias, others one of the prophets. And then he goes on and asks, verse 29, but whom say ye that I am? Now, Jesus was not those things. And Peter would go on to say, thou art the Christ. Uh, but you know, the world tries to tell us all kinds of ideas about who Christ is. They try to give us this perception of Jesus that is oftentimes extremely contrary and separate from what the scriptures lay out for us. Are we accepting or are we thinking or are we viewing Jesus based upon the way in which the world wants us to view Jesus and describe Jesus? Or are we viewing Jesus based upon his question here as the Christ, the Messiah, Lord of Lords? King of Kings? Do we view him as all authoritative? Do we view him as the final judge? Do we view him as the one who came to save us from our sins? How do you view Jesus tonight? Who would you say he is? And where are you spiritually? If you're not right with the Lord this evening, don't walk out of here not making it right. Why would you? Make it right with you by obeying the uh, gospel if you're not yet a Christian. Being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Brother or sister, if you've fallen away from the Lord, if you're not in the place where you need to be, you're not going to get any stronger avoiding Him. You're not going to figure it out on your own. Why don't you come home tonight? Why don't you make the decision to be restored? If you have any spiritual need, won't you please come forward? All together we stand and sing.